And in the book, Discourse on Evidences of the American Indians Being the Descendants of the Lost Tribes of Israel by M.M. Noah, 1837. The Indians, like the Hebrews, speak in parables of their dialects. There is no doubt that the Algonquin and Huron are the parents of 500 Indian tongues. They are copious, rich, regular, forcible, and comprehensive. And although here and there strong Hebrew analogies may be found, yet it is reason to suppose that the Indian languages are a compound of all those tongues belonging to the various Asiatic nations through which they pass during their pilgrimage. Before we continue, I just wanted to emphasize what he said about the, uh, you know, the languages having, you know, so many similarities to the Hebrew and how Algonquin is one of the parent languages so I wanted to show you this. So I wanted to show you, uh, for example, in this book I found here, it's called Antiquities, the first book of the New English history. So they're talking about New England up there in, uh, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, um, Vermont, New Hampshire, all that area up there, right? New England. Uh, all right. So just wanted to go to this page real quick. So they get there. Uh, this part of the book, they're talking about a place called Nahum Kik, Nahum Chik or Nahum Kik. 
all right of which place i have somewhere met with an odd observation that the name of it was rather hebrew hebrew than indian for nahum signifies comfort and cake signifies haven in our english not only found it an haven of comfort but happened also to put an hebrew name upon it for they called it salem for the peace which they had and hoped in it and so it is called unto this day so you see salem actually was an original hebrew uh, vibration which sounded like nahum cake nahum cake which meant comfort haven comfort a haven of comfort a salem a pl a place of peace all right and remember this area is algonquin languages all right so i have another example here this is in another book it's called a key into the languages of america or a, a help to the language of the natives in that part of america called new england right so algonquin together with brief observations of the customs manners and worships of the natives all right so in this area right so this is written in 1643 the other one was actually from 1709 i believe got to tell you all right, it's a little blurry here but i just want you to see so it says first others and myself so the, he had he goes through a lot of points so right away in this book his first point of, of what he wants to say about these indians he's encountering these algonquin speaking indians right it says the first others and i and myself have conceived some of their words to hold affinities with the hebrew 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 secondly they constantly anoint their heads as the jews did all right thirdly they give dow dowries for their wives as the jews did all right so this is just another example and this is from an original writing in 1643 all right okay so I wanted to show, so I wanted to go over this uh, great video. I saw it a long time ago. I've been wanting to share it. You know, I was thought it was really cool how this indigenous brother from the uh, Mashatok or Massachusetts tribe, as you know, he's gonna say the pronunciation, the correct one, uh, how he corrects these uh, brothers. Not maybe corrects them, but informs them. I guess they didn't know. So much love to the, uh, you know, Hebrew red light brothers out there, you know, nothing against them. A lot of them are, you know, Pan-Africans. You know, a lot of them got good intentions and good hearts. So, you know, we're all in a journey. But this indigenous brother is going to let them know who he is, you know, straight up. He's, he's going to let them know straight up, Joshua Rala. Let's go. Y'all got any questions? No, I'm just checking this all out. Just checking out. What's up, man? What's your nationality, bro? This is my tribe right here. But it's, but it's not Cuban though, it's incorrect. What's your, what, what is it? It's Masachua. It's a little different. What's but it's mean? Manasa, it's, it's the same thing. What you mean, like, uh, 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 but your people come from Cuba? Nah. Which, where your people come from? Israel. Israel? What part of Israel? Israel, that's here. Manessa, okay, but what do they call your people on this side of the earth? Masachuak. Masachuak, that's a native tribe? Yeah, all right, so let me explain. The brother's walking by. He sees the billboard, you know, the Hebrew Israelite Red Light Brothers in the corner, you know, showing the different tribes and where they're located in America. So he so he sees, you know, his tribe, which is the uh, Masachuak or Manasse or massachusetts as we're gonna see and he actually corrects the brother he says hey but we're not from cuba man he's like so where are you from man he's like massachuac he doesn't understand yet he's like what is that a tribe so he's gonna explain to him and he let him know we're from israel right what does he mean we're from jacob right we're israelites israel is not a place it's a lineage it's a family jacob right the descendants of jacob right so listen to the brother all right this is from the horse's mouth so you guys can see what he's going to tell him massachusetts state named themselves after our tribe but this is how the tribe is pronounced okay Manasa. so algonquin language is the same as 
Israel language, the same as Hebrew language. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. My language is very similar to this. Okay, okay, okay. So y'all interesting. All right, all right. So why did we just read in this book right before we got to this video, right? The brother just said that the Algonquin and the Hebrew is almost the same, basically the same. And he's telling you he's from Israel. He's the Manasseh, Masashwak, right? And this book told us, remember Salem and all this, Nahum Kik, Nahum Kik was kind of Hebrew, it sounded very Hebrew, all right? It's correlating with what the brother is saying, so pay attention. Y'all, y'all down here from from Boston now. Or yeah, from Mary. Okay, okay, okay. You got it. Yeah, it was just interesting to see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's cool. I saw it early. I was like, yo, that's crazy. It's got our tribe on it. Yeah, they only got 565 federally acknowledged. Right, acknowledged. Yeah. But there's thousands that are unknowledged, and every single last one of you guys standing out here comes from one of those tribes too. That are unacknowledged by the feds, but acknowledged by the Creator. Which okay, is but what you're saying is. Basically, you're acknowledging that we all go back Absolutely. to Israel. That's Absolutely. Absolutely. But everybody thinks Israel is somewhere else. That's oh, also another problem. What are you saying? Are you, you saying this Israel is, is Israel. America? This is Israel. Why do you believe that this is Israel? I'll tell you why I know that. Okay. Because 10,000 years ago, they found an ancient rock from my tribe, okay? And it was very prehistoric. It was about 10,000 years old. And the language on there is the same language as... The Hebrew language, yeah. right? But also, what's interesting about this rock is that the story is the story of the Jewish high holidays, but it's ours. And then they replicated the story of the Jewish high holidays off of our actual um, documentation on the rocks. The story is off the rock. You see, you see, that's the problem. See, people don't know. Yasharala is over here. Israel, Jasharala, the promised land, well, he means the promised land is over here. Jasharala is over here, all right? And he got the proof. He got a stone, right? He's saying they replicated his story. They turned it into the Bible, all right? That's his people's story. That's how he knows. How are you going to tell him? That's his people's story, all right? We're going to get it one more time. Pay attention to the brother, what he got to say. All right, because everybody think it's over there in the Middle East, and it's not. I'm gonna let an Israelite tell you where it's at. But everybody thinks Israel is somewhere else. That's oh, also another problem. What are you saying? Are you you saying this Israel is, is Israel. America? This is Israel. Why do you believe that this is Israel? I'll tell you why I know that. Okay. Because ten thousand years ago, they found an ancient rock from my tribe. Okay, and it was very prehistoric. It was about ten thousand years old. And the language on there is the same language as the Hebrew language, yeah. right? But also, what's interesting about this rock is that the story is the story of the Jewish high holidays, but it's ours. And then they replicated the story of the Jewish high holidays off of our actual um, documentation on the rocks. The story is off okay. the rock. Yeah, absolutely, man. What's your name, brother? Yeah, Chief Wampamik and Wampachuk, man. Chief. Real pleasure, man. Right. Yeah, real from, pleasure. From a chief to a chief, man. Yeah. It's good to meet you. Pleasure, What's your man. name, Kim? Pleasure, man. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. What's your name, brother? I'm sorry, then, at all. My Alice. 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 <laughs> Yo, how you feeling? He's our tribal chief justice. He runs our tribal court for our, our tribe. But it's all good, man. You guys keep building, yeah, definitely, man. Definitely, man. Beautiful. Glad man. to meet you, man. We had the stuff now to get the information out. You we didn't really got no excuse. It ain't like a yeah. hundred years. You guys get a salute? We got to get down. Cool. So this is the book Menasseh Ben Israel and His World. It says the rise and fall of the Jewish Indian theory. Okay, so so according to the Puritans, because they were living there, it says besides the settler missionaries found matters in Massachusetts Bay Colony quite different than Meade had described. They found docile, friendly Indians. Some of whom wanted to become Christians, according to them, right? I don't know if they would really want to become Christians. They established schools for them, and they tried to get the great John Comenius to use Harvard as the center of universal enlightenment for Indians and Europeans. They translated the scriptures for the Indians. It says, and it continues, so pay attention to this part. The missionaries began to suspect something radically different was going on in the environs of Boston, namely, namely that pure English Christians were baptizing and converting Indians who were Jews. Wow. All right. What were they doing? 
they were baptizing and converting Indians who were Jews. So that's what the Puritan, Puritans were realizing. And if the Indians were Jews, an enormous missionary effort would be needed. So on behalf of the New England Missionary Society, volume was written by the Norfolk preacher Juan Thomas Thorogood called Jews in America, or the probability that the Indians are Jews. This was dedicated to Charles I. And it says, continuing with Bodinat, while Bodinat and Crawford and other millenarians, people who believed that the uh, end of the world was coming during that time, saw the Indians as the lost tribes, new evidence emerged. The two new theories were offered in one that of the leading Jewish spokesman, Mordecai Noah, the other by the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith. The new evidence were some artifacts that were discovered, one phylacteries that were found in Indian burial mound in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, another a Hebrew inscription outside New Mil Milford, Connecticut, the third a Hebrew tomb in Ohio, added to the alleged resemblances that the Lord Kingsborough thought he had found in the Aztec codices to ancient Hebrew motifs. Lord Kingsborough published nine folio volumes of the codices, magnificently illustrated with copious notes from Menasseh, Adair, and others, to prove the Indians, especially those of Central America, were Jews. Although he bankrupted himself in the process of publishing the material, he convinced only the already convinced and became a laughing stock to others. The Hebrew inscription in New Milford was examined by America's greatest Christian Hebraist, Ezra Stiles, president of Yale, okay, Yale University, again, who guessed it was somebody's name. No one in the area could be found who was Jewish or who knew Hebrew. So a, suggest so a suggestive mystery remained. The phylacteries were a more exciting find. When it was realized that these are used by a Jew in his morning prayers, the physical object was found around 1820, halfway down a pile of Indian bones in a burial mound. Because of the Hebrew letters contained in the object, Christian scholars from Harvard were consulted who identified the object for what it was. But how did it get to where it was found? An intensive investigation was carried out to find out if any Jewish traders had been in Pittsfield, if any captured British soldiers had held there were Jewish, with negative results. The great Jewish convert, the Reverend Joseph Frey, who gave 30,000 sermons in America, said he had never spoken in Pittsfield, and the phylacteries were not his. Says the literature of the period indicates that this discovery was taken very seriously as pointing to the possibility that the Indians were Jewish. No other explanation could be found for the phy phylacteries being where they were found. The item was deposited with the Massachusetts Historical Society for further study. By now, when some of us would like to see what was discovered, however, the item has been lost. Here we go again. The item was lost. Like everything else that doesn't fit into history. All right, so I'm in this book now. It's called uh, Publications of the American Jewish Historical Society, number 11. And we're going to go to page 75 of this book. And it says here, The Jews of New England other than Rhode Island prior to 1800 by Leon Hunter AM. So as the Puritan Revolution in New England had awakened a keen interest in the Jewish race, and this interest was powerfully reflected in early New England history. It is in Massachusetts that this tendency was most strongly exhibited in Massachusetts. Hmm. Hebrew was carefully taught at Harvard College and the restoration of the Jews was one of the most popular topics. The restoration of the Jews, all right? In 1649, Eliot, the missionary, announced that the Indians were of Hebrew origin. Whoa, what? Yep. John Eliot, right? He also translated one of the first Bibles into the Algonquin language. Actually, the first Bible in the U.S. was in Algonquin. It was done here by supposedly by John Elliot and it says here that in 1649 he announced that the Indians were of Hebrew origin all right number two says here the footnote and it says it's felt ecclesiastical history 
Right, so this is the book, The Ecclesiastical History of New England, comprising not only religious, but also moral and other relations by Joseph B. Felt. All right, this is volume two, 1862. All right, in page 12 of this book, it says here, July 8th, Eliot communicates his purpose to Whitfield for translating the Bible into Indian tongue and educating some Indian youths. All right, so remember I told you, he wrote the first Bible in the Americas. It was actually in Algonquin, complete Bible done in the Algonquin language by John Eliot. All right, and it says here that he was uh, translating the Bible to educate some of the Indian Jews and mentions the need of help from the charitable. He previously communicated his opinion that the Indians here were of Hebrew origin. All right, so it's in here. We verified the source, right? Ecclesiastical history of New England. John Elliot letting you know, right, that the Indians here were of Hebrew origin. All right, why is he saying that? All right, so back in the other book, all right, the American Jewish Society book that we were just reading. So we were able to verify the source, right? Uh, it says in footnotes too. So again, John Elliot in 1649 announced that the Indians were of Hebrew origin. In the following year, Downham issued an appeal to Englishmen for contributions to Indian missions on the plea that those of New England were of Jewish descent. All right, they were of what? Hebrew descent. All right, that's three. Again, that's page 17 in the same one, Felt's Ecclesiastical History. When in 1650, Thorogood publishes Jews in America, we've read from that, Eliot of Massachusetts at once proclaimed that the 37th chapter of Ezekiel principally apply to the Indians as such use. All right. So John Elliot's letting you know that the 37th chapter of Ezekiel principally applied to the Indians. All right. And stated that the New England churches were the preface to the new ha ha havens. All right. You see what's going on in Massachusetts in the 1600. We're back in the book, Ecclesiastical History of New England. All right. And page 17, just want to go ahead and verify that. In his appeal for the cause of missions here, the Reverend John Downham addresses his countrymen in England. Come forth, ye masters of money. Part with your goal to promote the gospel. Let the gift of God in temporal things make way for the Indians' receipts of spirituals. He also takes the ground that the Indians of New England are of Jewish descent. All right. And we're still in this book, uh, page 22, Ecclesiastical History of New England. It says, this year, Mr. Thorogood publishes a treatise. This is page 22. This year, Mr. Thorogood publishes a treatise in England entitled Jews in America, or probabilities that the Americans are of that race. Sewell states that Eliot, the missionary, believed that the 37th chapter of Ezekiel was principally applicable to the Indians as such Jews. And many other parts of scripture, many other parts of scripture apply to the Indians. All right, back in the book, American Jewish Historical Society, number 11. And in the notes here again in this book, as it is curious to note also the strange arguments employed to prove the Indians of Jewish origin. Thus, in connection with the settlement of Salem in 1626, we read that it was called by the Indians Nahum Keiki. All right, so remember, I think in part three, I talked about this. We read what it meant. It meant the place of Salem, a place of haven, a haven, a place of peace, a place of peace. Nahum KK, like a Salem, right? So the word is, wasn't named by any European. They already had that um, name for that place in their language, Nahum KK. White says the opinion is held by some of that Indians might formerly have had some intercourse with the Jews. However, it be... It falls out that the name of the place with which our late colony has chosen for their seat proves it to be perfect Hebrew, being called Nahum KK. I told you that's a Hebrew word and it means place of uh, a haven, a place of peace, or Salem. By interpretation, the bosom of consolation. All right, so he's letting you know that no European came here and named that place Salem. The Indians already had that name for that area in their own paleo ancient Ibadi of language whatever you want to call it it's labeled Hebrew today right but we're talking about the mother tongue all right so it was named Nahum KK by them it was already called Salem 
all right cotton matter also says of which place i have also somewhere met with an odd observation that the name of it was rather hebrew than indian for nahum signifies comfort and cake means haven and our english not only found it a haven of comfort but happened also to put a hebrew name upon it for they called it salem for the peace they had and hoped in it and so it is called unto this day so in reality you know what they named it salem because they asked the indians what now whom cake meant and so like oh this is a salem and they knew it was hebrew so they just named it in english all right so we continue in the book, American Jewish Historical Society, number 11, page 76, says when in 1650, great mortality occurred among the colonists, it was supposed to be the preparation for the calling of the Jews. This subject engrossed the leading mind, and Roger Williams, sending a pamphlet on the subject to Winthrop in 1654, says, I pray you read this, Jew. By 1665, the view was generally held in Massachusetts, at least, that the outcasts of Israel were about to be gathered together and the great number of works published on that topic at that period in massachusetts alone is simply amazing this was what they were talking about why were they talking about this only during that period in massachusetts what else is going on in the 1600s aren't they sending pequits and enslaving the indians as well sending the pequits away a lot of the uh, uh native tribes up there in new england in massachusetts weren't they doing that also all right, but they're also talking about what the Indians were and who they were. And it was a big topic. It was simply amazing how much information, how, how popular this topic was at that time. Since delivering the present lecture, I have received a letter from Mr. Catlin, the celebrated painter. And we know who that is, right? From a Aboriginal to uh, American to African American videos. He was one of the uh, actually wrote about the copper colored uh, natives, their hair uh, styles uh, that he painted them the way he painted them. You know the copper complexion, so called Negro complexion, and some of the paint. Most a lot of the paintings actually. Uh, so it's, they're referring to him here. It says the celebrated painter, who for the last five years has been residing among the Indians. Mr. Catlin says. The first thing that strikes the traveler in an Indian country as evidence of their being of Jewish origin, and it is certainly a very forcible one, is the striking resemblance which they generally bear in counter and expression of head to those people. In their modes and customs, there are many striking resemblances, and perhaps as proof, they go much further than mere personal resemblance. Amongst those customs, I shall mention several that have attracted my attention, though probably they have never before been used for the same purpose and others i may name which are familiar to you and which it may not be amiss to mention as i have seen them practice while in their country the universal custom among them of burying their dead with feet to the east i could conceive have no other meaning or object than a journey to the east after death like the jews who expected to travel underground after death to the land of canaan on inquiry i found that though they were all going towards the setting sun during their lifetimes, they expected to travel to the east after death. Amongst the tribes, the women are not allowed to enter the medicine lodge. They were not allowed in Judea to enter the court of Israel. Like the Jewish customs also, they are not allowed to mingle in worship with the men and at meals are always separated. In their modes, fastings, feastings, or sacrifices, they also have, uh, they have also a most striking resemblance. Amongst all the western tribes who have not been persuaded from those forms by white men, they are still found scrupulously and religiously adhering to and practicing them to the letter. The very many time, times and modes of sacrificing remind us of forcibly of the customs of the Israelites, and the one in particular, which has been seen among several of the tribes, though I did not witness it myself, wherein, like the manner of the peace offering, the firstlings and that of the male is offered, and no bone is to be broken. Such circumstances are for the strongest kind of proofs. All the tribes have a great feast at the dawn of spring, and at those feasts their various sacrifices are made. At the approach of the season of green corn, a feast of the first ears are sacrificed with great solemnity, followed by a feast and dancing. So at the ripening of different kinds of fruit, the first and best piece that is cut from a buffalo is always Deodante. Over the medicine lodge, and 
Also, over the lodges of the most distinguished chiefs are hung on high posts large quantities of fine cloth, white buffalo robes, or other most costly articles which can be procured there to decay and offering to the great spirit. The bunch of willow booths with which each dancer is supplied in the Mandan religious ceremonies, the sacrificing and other forms therein observed, certainly render it somewhat analogous to the Israel, Israelitish feast of the tabernacles. The universal practice of solis cum sola, of the women ablution and anointing with beer's grease, is strikingly similar to the Jewish custom. Every family has a small lodge expressly for this purpose, and when any of the family are ready for it, it is erected within a few rods, and meat is carried to her where she dwells, and cooks and eats by herself, an object of superstitious dread to every person in the village. The absence of every species of idolatry amongst the North American Indians affords also a striking proof of the ceremonial law, and stamps them at once in one respect, at all events, differing from all other savage tribes of which we have any knowledge. What are, I may ask, the characters of these people? On the discovery of America by Columbus, nearly 2,000 years after the dispersion of the Hebrew tribes, the whole continent is found peopled not with a race of wild men, of cannibals, of savages, but with a race of intellectual, moral, innocent persons divided into many hundred nations and spread over 8,000 miles of territory. I swear to your majesty, said Columbus, writing to Ferdinand and Isabella, that there is not a better people in the world than these, more affectionate or mild. He's talking about you, so-called Negro. They love their neighbors as themselves. Their language is the sweetest, the softest, and the most cheerful, for they always speak smilingly. Major Long says they are the genuine sons of nature. They have all the virtues nature can give without the vices of civilization. They are artless, fearless, and live in constant exercise of moral and Christian virtues. Christian dodge the hijack, though they know they though they know it not. Charleville gives the, his testimony in their behalf. They manifest, says he, much stability in their engagements, patience in a fiction and submissive acquaintances in what they apprehend the will of providence. In all this they display a nobleness of soul and constancy of mind, at which we rarely arrive with all our philosophy and religion. So he's saying the Indians display a nobleness of soul, soul, Rasta got soul, you know what I mean? And constancy of mind at which we rarely arrive with all our philosophy and religion. He's talking about the Europeans. They don't ever get to that state of, of, of nobleness or constancy of mind. The Prats contends that they have a greater degree of prudence, faithfulness, and generosity than those who would be offended with a comparison with them. No people, says he, are more hospitable and free. Bartram, who lived many years in the Creek Nation, says, Joy, contentment, love, and friendship without guilt or affectation seem inherent in them or predominant in their vital principle, for it leaves them but with their breath. They are, says he, just honest, liberal, and hospitable to strangers, considerate and affectionate to their wives, children, and relations, frugal, persevering, charitable, and forbearing. Who are they? Men do not grow up like stones or trees or rocks. They are not found in herds like wild animals. God, that made man in his own image, gave to the Indians an origin and parentage, like unto the rest of the great family of mankind. The works of his own almighty hand, from whom them did our red brethren, the rightful owners of this continent, the sun, dodge the hijack red, copper-colored tribes of America. If the Indians of America are not descendants of the missing tribes again, I have, I ask, from whom are they descended? So you see 
it goes on and on they're trying to figure out who you are and again drop nation if they cannot tell you who you are how can they tell you who you're not they are so intrigued they are so confused you know they want to know so bad who are you who are they descended from the egyptians you know where was ancient egypt america so maybe where in their beliefs is there at least resemblance to the worship of isis and osiris or the hieroglyphics or historical reminiscences of that very ancient people are they part of the fierce scythians their warlike propensities would prove them to be so but were among the barbarians do we discover the belief in one great spirit together with the softer virtues the purity and talents of the indians are they of the tartar race their complexion the shadow livery of the burning sun might be off offered in evidence they have not the flat head the angular and twinkling eye nor the diminutive figure of the chinese or tartars the indians have distinct jewish features and neither in mind manners nor religion bear any affinity to the tartar race i have endeavored to show this by their traditions by their religion by their ceremonies which retain so much of the ancient worship but there is one proof more which in my mind removes all doubt Sir Alexander Mackenzie in his journal of, on a tour to the northwest continent of America declares from his own observation that the Chippewa Indians practice circumcision which fact is corroborated by several other travelers amongst the various tribes we owe the people of Abraham Isaac and Jacob we owe our support and our allegiance.